Okay, so as I was saying, what you now know how to do is draw the two-dimensional, the flat version of the molecule. But again, you don't know the way it actually looks in three dimensions. And we really have to be concerned with the shape because the shape of the molecule, in a very surprising fashion, has to do with all kinds of stuff you would never suspect. For example, so for example, the shape has to do with reactivity. It has to do with the phase. If it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. It's a solid, then you bend it, now it's a liquid. It has to do with the color. It's green, now you bend it, it's purple. Magnetism. It wasn't magnetic, now it is. The taste of it. It smells like carnation, smells like farts, whatever it is. Same molecule, just change the, change the shape a little bit. Uh, the taste of it. Is it toxic or not? So many things have to do with shape. So you might already know, for example, like, like with enzymes, right? For example, in your body, in enzymes, enzymes work on what's called a lock and key mechanism. And there is a certain shape of the molecule that has to fit in a certain shaped hole in the enzyme. Or with neurotransmitters in your nerves. You have these nerve receptors, and they have a certain shape, certain shape, and a certain shape transmitter fits in them. Or smell or taste. The reason certain things smell certain ways is those molecules have a certain shape and they will fit then into that shaped receptor in your nose or in your taste bud. So shape has everything to do with all kinds of crazy stuff you would never suspect. Well, the way we try to figure out what the shape of the molecule is, is we use this theory. It's a big scary word, but it's called VSEPR theory, which stands for VS, valence shell, EP, electron pair, R theory, repulsion theory. So again, it's a big, scary, long-sounding term, but it's really not that bad. So basically it says we're going to look at the valence shell electron pairs, which is exactly what we just did for the Lewis structures. We count up all the valence shell electrons, and we put them in pairs, either bonding pairs or non-bonding pairs. But now we're concerned with the repulsion, because the electrons all have a negative charge. And we know if you have things that have negative charges, what do they want to do with one another? They want to repel each other. So exactly. So exactly. So in those two-dimensional structures you drew, they will actually want to try to spread out the electrons to get as much distance as they can between them because they have repulsion. They don't want to come together for any reason because they're same charge. So basically this theory says you are going to spread out the electrons as far apart from each other as you can possibly get them. Okay, so that's called VSEPR theory. So we're going to zero in on the center atom and spread the electrons around it as evenly and as far apart as we can. So what you're going to focus in on are these things called electron groups. So the electron groups that are on the center atom. Now an electron group could be just a lone pair on the center atom. Or an electron group could be any kind of bond, single, double, or triple. So a single bond is still one group of electrons. A double bond is not two groups. It's still one group of electrons. A triple bond is not three groups. It's still one group of now six electrons. So an electron group can either be a lone pair or any kind of bond. Okay? A lone pair or any kind of bond, single, double, or triple, any kind of bond. CO, by the way. Okay? So, let's say we have, for example, a nice Lewis structure you drew, and you realize there are going to be two electron groups on it. Well, what's the best way to separate two things around it? Well, two things, put them straight across from each other, 180 degrees. So, two electron groups is going to take a linear geometry, right? There's no reason for them to come closer because if you do, they're going to repel and go back as far apart as they possibly can get, right? Does that make sense? It's like if you have in your hand two magnets and you bring them together, they're going to force each other apart, right? As far as they possibly can. That's called linear geometry. What if you have three electron groups? Well, the best way to try to spread out three things is 120 degrees. And that we call trigonal planar, because it winds up looking just like a triangle, which is where the trigonal comes from. And notice it's all in the plane. 
It's all flat, so it's called planar. That's called trigonal planar. So you arrange three things 120 degrees apart. So you basically have made a big triangle. And one electron group is on each corner of the triangle. So that's three electron groups. And the last case we'll look at here is four electron groups. Come back in 110 and we'll do five and six also. But just four. Now, you might first think, oh, well, two is 180, three is 120, four must be 90. And that would be true if you were just thinking two-dimensionally. But we're trying to think three-dimensionally. And there actually is a better angle you can get even farther apart for four things. Not 90, you can actually get about to 109.5 if you think about it three-dimensionally. And that's called a tetrahedral geometry. And that looks basically like a little pyramid with four sides. It's this pyramid with four sides, which is why it's called a tetra four hedron sides, you know, like a polyhedron. You might have heard that term back in geometry. Many sides. So all of these, every single one of these is 109.5 apart. They're all the exact distance. So they're maximized apart. So that's the three you have to worry about. So if you have two electron groups, linear. Three electron groups, trigonal planar. Four electron groups, tetrahedral. And again, the name makes sense because trigonal planar is a triangle, trigonal, and it's flat. It's all on one plane. Tetrahedral, four sides. It's a little triangle with four faces, right? The bottom and then three around the So it's four sides. Okay. So, now that's called the electron geometry. Now that may or may not be the same as what's called the actual molecular geometry. The molecular geometry, you only consider the atoms. You don't consider the lone pairs. So you're just looking at the atoms because the lone pairs, in a sense... Um, uh, in a sense, are um, uh, like invisible. So, if you have a lone pair on the central atom, then the electron geometry will not be the same as the molecular geometry. The electron and molecular geometries are not the same if there's a lone pair on the central atom. The electron geometry, molecular geometry, is not the same if there is a lone pair on the center atom. Because for the molecular, again, we're just looking at the atoms. The lone pairs are basically invisible. You wouldn't actually see them in a molecule. You would just see the atoms, the, I mean the actual atoms out there. Okay, so let me give you an example. Let's use ammonia, NH3. So if you drew ammonia's Lewis structure, you might draw that. Okay? So you draw that. We'll figure out how many electron groups are on the center atom. So first off, the center atom. So we're just focused in on the nitrogen. Not the other ones, just the center atom. So how many groups of negative charge are there? Okay, well I'm going to look here. So the lone pair is some negatives, right? Are you with me? Each bond is some negatives. See that? So I have four groups of negative charge, four electron groups. So this has four electron groups. So what's the best way to spread out four electron groups we just learned? Tetrahedral, yes. So you might get something like this. So you have a pyramid, and there's a different electron group on every corner. It could be a bond, or it could be a lone pair, but there's four different things spread out. So they're all spread out 109.5 away from each other. Okay, so that's the electron geometry. The electron geometry, tetrahedral. You're absolutely correct. But the molecular geometry, if I were just to look at that, and all I was going to look at was just the atoms, and I suddenly, you know, you know so, so I'm not seeing this piece of the pyramid, doesn't look like a tetrahedral anymore. 
So the molecular geometry is something different. In that case, we call it trigonal pyramidal. Do you need a better chair? Are you okay with that? I'll, 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 say, I'll say that we're behind you there. Trigonal pyramidal. Some people will also say trigonal pyramidal, but I learned it pyramidal. But because there's four things here, but this one you don't see. So it looks differently from the electron geometry. So why is that true? Because there is a lone pair on the center atom. If there's a lone pair, the electron geometry is always different from the molecular geometry. So, let's make a little chart of some things to learn. Let me show you the different electron geometries and the different molecular geometries. So here's the little chart. That's kind of tiny. So I'm going to redraw it uh, here. So this is table 5.16. So, so maybe just turn your notes, you know, make a little note, table 5.16. You're going to put this into your brain. Learn table 5.16. We're going to learn the different geometries. I'm going to show you it's really not that bad. Once you, I'll show you how it works out here. So let's say, for example, Michael was walking through my classroom. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's say, for example, let me give you some different cases here, okay? Work with me. Okay, here it goes. Okay, so let's say I'm going to look at number of electron groups. How about I just put EG to save space? Number of electron groups, okay? That's what I'm going to look at my table. Then I'm going to look at, okay, how many of those are um, number of bonding? groups, number of non-bonding groups or lone pairs. Can you read that? Non-bonding groups or lone pairs. Okay. Then we have the electron geometry. Geo and the molecular geometry. Okay, so if I have two electron groups, we said, they will always both be bonding. You won't ever have any lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. All right, these could also be called lone pairs. Okay, so that comes out to be linear, we said. And since they're both atoms, there's no lone pairs, it looks linear also. So it's the exact same. Easy peasy. Now, if there's three electron groups, we have two options. They could all be bonded to atoms and no lone pairs. So the electron geometry for three things, we just told you, is called trigonal planar. And if there's no lone pairs, well, then it's the same molecular geometry. Trigonal planar. I don't have room, so I'm going to write trigonal pl. Same thing. Okay, you write that. I'm going to grab a model kit. Okay, Okay. 
Nope, nope. Okay, so I'm having a hard time finding one. I need like a... Okay, so this would be trigonal planar. So I've got three things, and I spread them apart as far as I possibly can, and it looks like a flat triangle. Can you see that? That's trigonal planar, right, when they're all atoms. So the electrons are trigonal planar, and it looks trigonal planar. Well, what if they aren't all atoms? What if only two of them are atoms and one of them is a lone pair? Well, the electron geometry is still trigonal planar. But if one of these is a lone pair, now it no longer looks trigonal planar. Do you see that? There is still, a, there is still like I said up here, a lone pair. It's invisible, but it doesn't look trigonal planar anymore, does it? How does this look to you? Exactly right. We call this bent. It's not straight, so the electron geometry becomes bent. Exactly what we call it. Huh? Bent? Bent. Yeah, but, burnt. Yeah. So here, oh, they're all three atoms. So it looks trigonoplanar. But if one suddenly vanishes as an electron pair and you don't see an atom there, now it no longer looks Trigonal planar, right? Okay, how about the case of four electrons? Again, four is as high as we'll go. Four. Well, if they're all four bonded to atoms and none are lone pairs, then the electron geometry is tetrahedral and it looks tetrahedral. Also, sorry, I ran out of room there. Well, what if one of these is now a lone pair? Let me find a tetrahedral here, one for you. Okay, so four things tetrahedral. They're all 109.5, whichever way you turn it, doesn't matter. 109.5, however I turn it, they're exactly 109.5 apart. So this is tetrahedral, right? So if they're all atoms, it looks tetrahedral. Well, what if one of these suddenly becomes a lone pair? Now it does not look like, like a tetrahedral anymore, right? Even though it's still 109.5, one of these is now an invisible lone pair up here. So we have to have a different name for that. That's what I just told you. That's called, still tetrahedral for electron, but the molecular shape is now called trigonal pyramidal. Okay. Last case. What if there's four electron groups, but two are bonded to atoms and two are lone pairs? Well, four electron groups is still tetrahedral electron geometry. But now let's imagine two of these turned into electron pairs and now they just disappeared. Now what does it look like? Bent again. So again, the molecular geometry only considers the atoms. The electron geometry considers all of the electron groups, atoms and lone pairs. Does that kind of make sense? So, there's only six possible scenarios. There's only three possible scenarios for electron geometries. There's only six possible scenarios for the molecular geometries. And again, our whole lab today is practicing this over and over and over and over. So it'll sink in with a lot of practice, hopefully. 
Okay, so let's try a few of these, and I'll do a few with you. So let's go back to those ones we just drew on experiment, on experiment, on example seven. So pull out your handout. Now we're going to figure out, okay, for those ones I just drew, <coughs> what's the electron geometry, and what is the molecular geometry? So I'm going to quickly draw... the Lewis structure again. So for hydrogen, two sulfurs, I mean two hydrogens, you drew this, right? That's the structure you drew, right? So, now we're going to fo focus in here and say, okay, how many electron groups are on that center atom, just the sulfur? One, two, three, four. Lone pairs and bonds are both groups of electrons. So there's four electron groups. So what's the electron geometry called for four electron groups? Tetrahedral. But two of these are bonded to atoms, two of these are lone pairs. So the molecular geometry has to be different. It's only the same if there's no lone pairs. So the molecular geometry is not called tetrahedral, it's called what? Bent. This right here, this is it. Because two of these are hydrogens, two of these you don't see are lone pairs. So that's why it's bent, okay? Okay, let's try the next one. SIF4, we drew something like this. Okay, so the plan is focus in on the center atom. How many electron groups are on the center atom? One, two, three, four. Again, we don't care about all those other lone pairs because they're not on the center atom, just on the center atom. So on the center atom, I have four electron groups, which means the electron geometry is tetrahedral again. Right? What's the molecular geometry called? They're all four bonding groups. There's no lone pairs, so it's the same thing. Also, tetrahedral. All right? So this one looks like a tetrahedral. If I put these little atoms back in here. It's an atom with four things attached to it. Again, perfectly symmetrical. 109.5, no matter how you turn it. All the same. Okay. Your turn. What was PCL3? Talk it over. You drew something like this. So figure it out. You drew it on number seven. So how many electron groups are there on the center atom? Talk it over. So what's the electron geometry? Are there any lone pairs? If so, it has to be a different name. So figure out that different name. Talk it over. See what your neighbor says there. Find somebody next to you, behind you, across from you, whatever. Find somebody. Okay, so what's the electron geometry? Yes, there are four electron groups on that center atom. Three are bonds, one's a lone pair. So the electron group, yes, is tetrahedral. The molecular geometry, is it also tetrahedral? No, because one of them is a lone pair, so it has to look different. What do we call that? Trigonal. Trigonal. Not 
trigonopyramidal or pyramidal. I guess I'll accept that. But trigonopyramidal. Okay. Okay. Okay, try the next one. What was CS2? You drew it earlier. You drew a structure that looked like this. Talk it over. How many electron groups are on the center atoms? Uh, two or four? What did I say about, about, about electron group? It can either be two doubles or triples. That's all still one group of electrons. Because that's not four things that can separate out four different ways. This has to stay together, this has to stay together. So yeah, that is just two electron groups. I can't break apart that bond into two different things. So again, if the bond's single, double, or triple, it's still one group of electrons, whether it's two, four, or six. So there's really, there's only two electron groups. So what's the, mo what's the electron geometry called for two electron groups? Linear, right, linear. And what's the molecular geometry? Linear, because there's no lone pairs on the central atom, right? Okay, last one. We drew three structures. I'll just draw one just for time's sake, but you drew like this. So when you look at that, figure it up. Talk it over with your neighbor. What do you think? What do you think? Talk it over. You were doing down here too, right? Oh. I put it down there. That's okay. That's okay. All right. Okay. So, talk it over. What do you guys think? What's the electron geometry? What's the molecular geometry? So refer to that little chart we just drew together. <clears throat> okay, so how many electron groups are on that center atom? Double, single, single. Doesn't matter if double or single, still one group. So three, so the best way to spread out three things is called Trigonal, now planar, right? Not pyramidal, planar. And what's the molecular geometry? The exact same, because there's no lone pairs on the center <laughs> atom. Okay? Get how that works? Okay, not too bad. Again, there's only six cases. Put those in your brain. And one way to do that is repetition. So we're going to do a bunch of these today and just do them over and over in the lab. We're going to do a whole bunch. Awesome. Great. Okay, well, last thing to talk about, and we'll wrap this up, is electronegativity and polarity. So I said earlier, I mentioned that term electronegativity. I said, oh, when you're putting lone pairs, start with the most electronegative atom first. So what is electronegativity? It's basically, it's the ability of an atom to try to attract those shared electrons in that bond towards itself. So again, every bond is two atoms sharing electrons. But that doesn't mean they're sharing them equally. Because one atom might have a higher electronegativity than the other one, which means that atom is trying to pull those electrons closer to itself and away from the other atom. Okay? So let me give you an example. Oxygen and hydrogen, they do not share electrons equally. So even though I might have I might have an oxygen hydrogen bond, which is two electrons, right? That does not mean those two electrons are shared split right down the center. Because in this case, oxygen is more electronegative, which means oxygen tries to take those negative charges and tries to pull them towards itself. So that means normally the electrons are spending more of their time around the oxygen than they are the hydrogen. 
So basically, like I said, it's just, it's just kind of shifting the electrons towards it. It's pulling the electrons towards itself. So, well, what's the charge on the electrons? Electrons are negative. So, the negatives are moving that way. So that means this end of the molecule becomes, this little symbol here, partially negative. That's the lower Greek, lowercase Greek letter delta. And since the negatives moved away from the hydrogen, well, the hydrogen end becomes a little bit or partially positive. Okay? So the oxygen became a little bit negative. Oxygen, hydrogen became a little bit positive. Okay. Well, this creates what's called a dipole moment. So I have, so it's like, again, on a magnet or something where you have two opposite poles, a negative pole and a positive pole. I have two poles or a die. Remember, die means two. Dipole, two poles. So I've created a little dipole moment. Now you will often see this written with a little vector, kind of like this. We'll so draw a line pointing towards the negative end with a little crossbar on the positive end. So the little, this is the positive end, it has a little plus kind of here. Kind of shows the electrons shifted that way, basically. So that's called a dipole moment. If you go into physics and you do anything with, or math, or or um, um, uh, like a math and calculus like with vectors, this is basically vectors. So you get to do vectors, add up vectors. So we're showing the ways the electrons are moving. Okay. Well, so if I have shared electrons in a covalent bond, but they're not sharing them equally. Well, then now I've created a negative pole and a positive pole, P-O-L-E, pole, not like P-U-L-L, -L, pulling, pole, you know, like, like North Pole, South Pole. So the bond is called a polar bond because it has poles, two poles. So when they're not shared equally, we call it a polar bond. Now, if they are shared equally, let's say they were both carbons, well then, or both oxygens. Well in that case, each oxygen is going to pull equally on the electrons, and they would share them equally. And we call that a nonpolar bond. So here's a little chart that shows you the values of electronegativity for the, for the main group elements, representative elements. And this was developed by a very famous American chemist named Linus Pauling. Maybe you ever heard of Linus Pauling? Completely genius. He won the Nobel Prize twice, not just once, twice, once in chemistry, once in peace, actually. Once the Nobel Prize twice. And this was his, his whole, one of his many, many, um, uh, one, of his, one of his many scientific contributions was a scale for measuring electronegativity. And he basically, I just made it out of a four point scale. I don't know why he chose four, but he did. So, so the most electronegative element ever is going to be a 4.0. Like A plus, I guess, 4.0, call it that. So, so fluorine. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. So whenever another atom tries to get in tug of war with fluorine, fluorine always wins and pulls the electrons towards it because it's the most electronegative element. See that? And then oxygen's the next most electronegative. And then nitrogen and chlorine are both tied at 3.0. See that? So basically, electronegativity kind of increases going up this way, up and to the right. So the most electronegative elements are up in the top right, fluorine, oxygen, chlorine. The least are down in the bottom left. So let's think about that for a second. Notice helium has no electronegativity. Neither does neon or argon or krypton. Why do they have no electronegativity? Um, um, well, they don't make very many bonds. Yes, you're, you're right. Why is that, though? Why do they make many bonds? Because they already have a filled outer shell, right? So they don't want any more electrons, do they? Right? They're already happy with their eight. 
So yeah, so there's no reason Neon wants to try to steal somebody else's. It's perfectly happy. But metals, you notice, are just the opposite. They have super low values, which means metals don't want electrons. Remember, if anything, we learned metals want to lose electrons and become positive. Remember? So yeah, so basically, this is how you kind of figure it out. And there was a pre-lab question that said, calculate the polarity for different bonds. What you would do is you would calculate, oh, so let's say it was that hydrogen and oxygen bond. Hydrogen's 3.5. I'm sorry, oxygen's 3.5. Hydrogen's 2.1, so it's a difference of 1.4. So it has a dipole moment or a difference there of 1.4. So that's a pretty polar bond. That's a pretty big difference of 1.4. Yes? I would give you the numbers on this. Yeah, I'll give you the numbers. You should know the general trend that it increases up to the right, the most electronegative is kind of up there. Okay. Well, what if they are the same? So they're both chlorines, they're both oxygens, they're both carbons. Well, now they're pulling then with an equal pull from both sides. So it's not creating a dipole, so that's called a non-polar dipole moment. Or, or I mean, a non-polar covalent bond. So if they're not sharing them equally, it's polar. If they are sharing them equally, well, now it's not polar. There's no positive negative. They're both equal. So exactly is what now? Nearly equal. Like I'll, I'll show you here. I'll show you here in a second on the next slide. Good question. Yeah, what's nearly equal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it may not be exactly equal, but it could be close enough. So what's close enough? I'll show you. Okay, so what? Good question. So if it's zero difference, which is basically the same, up to 0.4 difference. That's small enough difference, we call that non-polar. So if the difference in the, in the electronegativity on that table I showed you, if the difference in the two is 0.4 or less, close enough non-polar bond. So for example, I'll give you an example, carbon-hydrogen bonds is a big example we'll see a lot. So carbon and hydrogen, any carbon-hydrogen bond. Carbon is 2.5, hydrogen's 2.1. So the difference is only 0.4. So that's so small. Even though it is a little different, we call it a non-polar bond because it's so small. So 0 to 0.4 is non-polar. Above 0.4, up to about 2.0, well, now we're still sharing, it's a covalent bond, but we're not sharing them equally. So we call it a polar covalent bond. So 0.5 up to 2.0, we're going to call that polar. Okay? And then once you get above a difference of 2.0, well, now they're so different, they're not really sharing anymore. At that point, at that point one of the atoms is pulling so hard on the electrons, it basically it just pimp slaps the other one and says, give me that electron, and it just takes it, and now we have an ionic compound, okay? So now one, so now we're getting into the transfer, we're not sharing, all the pretense of sharing is gone, one has taken the electron totally from the other one, so give me that electron. So when you're above 2.0, that's a big difference, and it's ionic. So 0.4 or less, nonpolar, pretty much equally sharing, 0.5 to 2, Still sharing, but not equally, so polar covalent bond. Above 2.0, no more sharing. That's basically an ionic bond at that point. Okay, got it? Okay. So, now just because the bonds in a molecule are polar does not mean the whole molecule itself, which is a sum of three or four bonds maybe, is polar. It doesn't always mean that. Okay, so it depends on each individual bond and how it ties in with the overall picture. So, here is the easiest way I know to explain this. And I know it's going to come up today in lab 40 times. If there is a symmetrical distribution of the charge, then it's going to be nonpolar. So I mean, 
let's say you have three atoms around a central atom, and they're all polar. They're all pulling the electrons towards them. But they're doing it symmetrically. They're pulling it the same strength in three different directions, but it's the same in all three directions. That's still symmetrical. So they all cancel out in a sense. So let me give you an example. Let's say we have carbon dioxide. That's carbon. You see here with two oxygens, right? So, yes, this is a polar bond. And this carbon oxygen is a polar bond. There's two polar bonds. But just because the bonds are polar doesn't mean the molecule is polar because it is very symmetrical. Because it's the same pole to the right as it is to the left. So, in a sense, the two poles cancel out. So oxygen pulls this way with its strength. Oxygen pulls the opposite way with the same exact strength, so it cancels out. Symmetry, so nonpolar overall, even though the bonds were polar. Symmetry is your friend. If it's symmetrical, it is nonpolar. That's the easiest way I know to say it. Well, what if it's a polar molecule, well that means it's asymmetrical or unsymmetrical. You have an asymmetrical or unsymmetrical distribution of charge. So now they're not all pulling the same way in every direction. One direction is pulling a little harder than another direction or something. Classic example is water. Water. If I look at water, hydrogen is more electronegative. I'm sorry, oxygen is more than hydrogen. So the oxygen pulls the electrons up here towards it. So let me draw the Lewis structure of water, and this will make it make a little more sense. Oxygen's Lewis structure is this. Okay? So let's look at it. How many electron groups are on that oxygen? One, two, three, four. Are all four electron groups the same thing? Are they all? No. Two of the electron groups are lone pairs. Two of the electron groups are bonded to hydrogens. They are not the same. So that is not symmetrical. So therefore, it's going to be a polar bond. That's the easy way I know to say it. If they were all four hydrogens, that would be symmetrical. That would be nonpolar. But in this case, they're not. Two of them are hydrogens, two of them are lone pairs. Not symmetrical, so it's polar. Okay. Let's try a couple here. So let's look at these five molecules I put up here. These are not in your handout or anything, but I'll just down up here in the PowerPoint. So the first one, you see on the first one, there is a, showing there is a polar bond from the hydrogen towards the chlorine. So it's making a dipole. See, see the little arrow it drew there? So is that, is that a symmetrical distribution of charge, nonpolar, or is it not symmetrical and it's polar? Definitely not symmetrical, right? Because it's only going in one direction. It's not like it's canceling out. So yes, that is definitely going to be Non-polar, yes. I mean polar, polar, because it's not symmetrical. Sorry, polar. The next one, there's three things, and they're all pulling up, and then on the top of there, even though you don't see it, is a lone pair up here. But there's three things all going up. So is that symmetrical? No. If they were all four the same, they would it'd be symmetrical. But there's three things going up, and there's nothing from the top canceling it out, pushing down, right? So that is polar also, yes. Number three, there's four chlorines, and they're all pulling out. So they're all pulling out, and they're all chlorines, so they're all pulling out with the same strength. So that's symmetrical, so that would be Nonpolar, right? Okay, BF3. Three things 
all pulling out and they're all fluorines. Non-polar, that's symmetrical. Yes, exactly. And the last one, one thing pulling up and three things not doing anything. So, yes, yes, polar, right? That's not symmetrical. If they were all hydrogens or all chlorines, then it would be equal pull in all directions, but it's not, so that's polar. Okay. Almost done here. So let's try a couple. So let's just do the whole shebang here. Let's do NBr3. Let me do NBr3 with you. Let's go through our steps here. So we need to do everything from soup to nuts, as they say, and figure out what's the total number of valence electrons, draw it out, everything. Okay, so how many valence electrons does every nitrogen give you? So grab your periodic table, or there's one over here on the wall. Okay, nitrogen gives me five. Then I got three bromines. They all give me how much? Seven. Seven, so that's 21. So how many total valence electrons do I have to play with? 26. Awesome, okay, so which atom goes in the center? Nitrogen, good. So I was going to put my three bromines, just kind of spread them around equally here. Okay, what's the next step? Bond them. One bond, two bonds, three bonds. So how many electrons does each bond use? So two times three, I just used six. So I have 20 electrons left. So what do I do with those remaining 20? Yeah, put them on the outside, give everybody lone pairs. On the outside first, if there's any left, do the inside. So every bromine needs how many more? Six. six. So right now every bromine has two, so I'm going to give them six more. One, two, three, four, five, six. There you go, bromine. Are you happy now? So, that, so how, many, how many there did I use? Six, six, and six. Mark of the beast. Six, six, six. Eighteen. I just used eighteen. Okay. I got two left. So where do I put the last two? On the center atom. So last step. Check and make sure we used up all of the lone pairs. And we did. Right? Okay. So. How many electron groups are on that center atom? One, two, three, four. Are they all four the same thing? Three are bromines, one's a lone pair. So if they're not all the same, is it polar or nonpolar? Yes. It was a long road to get there, but we got there. So... If they were all four bromines, then you would have said yes. Or if there was three bromines and no lone pair, oh, they're all three the same, whatever it is, right? Okay, your turn. Try S2Cl+. Oh, my battery's running low. Let me plug that in while you're working. What do you guys think? Is it polar or nonpolar? You think it's polar? Okay, so you draw a chlorine in the center, some sulfurs.
Then what do we got? We got, is there a double bond or something? Okay, so how many electron groups are on that? One, two, three. Are all three the same? No, two of them go to sulfurs, one of them goes to a lone pair. So they're not all the same, so it's polar. <coughs> now, I do want to point out one thing. The fact that one is double and one is single, that doesn't matter because they're still going to the same thing as sulfur. So I'll give you an example real quick. Remember we did nitrate earlier, and it was nitrogen, double, double, single, single. Remember that one we did? Work with me, stupid thing. All right, we did this one. Now students always want to say, oh, Two singles and a double, those aren't the same. But really, I told you, it's really more like that double could be anywhere. So it is kind of spread out over all three. So that is still symmetrical. That is still nonpolar. So don't think, oh, single, single, double is different. Because really, again, that double is kind of spread out of all three at the same time. Okay, well, NH4, did you already try NH4? Okay, and you probably got this. Oh, by the way, on the last one, I forgot to draw my square brackets on my last one. I apologize. This one I will remember. So, this one has four electron groups. Are they all four the same? Yes, they're all four hydrogens. So, it's symmetrical, so it's nonpolar. Woo! My brain hurts. Okay. In the home stretch, probably five, ten minutes. I'm sorry. Probably, probably ten minutes. Okay, last thing. So let's talk about intermolecular forces. And especially in liquids, but in general. So, what does inter mean? You know, like, you know, intermolecular, international, interstate between, between nations, between states. So intermolecular forces are forces between molecules. Forces that are actually within a molecule, like a covalent bond or an ionic bond, those are intramolecular. So these are forces between molecules. So how is one water attracted to another water? Or how is one carbon dioxide attracted to another carbon dioxide? So that's the realm of intermolecular forces. So there are three types we're going to look at. One is called D London, I'm sorry, the okay, first one's dipole, dipole forces. Then we're going to look at what are called hydrogen bonds. And then we're going to look at what are called dispersion or London forces. By the way, not named for the city London, named for a person named London. So, we'll take a few minutes and look at each one of these. The dipole, dipole, hydrogen bonds, and dispersion or London forces. So, let's look at dipole, dipole first. You have those written down? Dipole, dipole, hydrogen bonding, or hydrogen bonds, and dispersion. Okay, so dipole, dipole is a force between one dipole and another dipole. And I just told you which molecules have these dipoles? Well, the ones that are polar. Polar molecules have dipoles because they're not symmetrical. So one side of the molecule is a little bit negative, one side of the molecule is a little bit positive. Well, what do opposite charges do? Yeah, they attract each other. So if I have the end of one molecule is a little bit positive, well, the, well, that positive end will throw an attraction towards the negative end of another molecule. So, for example, you see here in these molecules we have FCL. The fluorine end is a little bit negative. See that in the picture? The chlorine end is a little bit positive. So you can imagine an attraction between all the fluorines towards the chlorines, and the fluorines to the chlorines, and the fluorines to the chlorines. Now, it's not a straight-up ionic molecule where it's 
a one positive and a one negative, but it is just a little bit positive. It's drawn towards a little bit negative. So that's basically what a dipole is. So you have to have one thing for this to happen. You've got to have polar molecules because nonpolar molecules don't have dipoles, so nonpolar molecules can't have these forces. Only polar molecules can have dipole-dipole forces. Okay. So let me show you an example here. So here are five different molecules, and they all have roughly the same weight. They're all around 40 to 50, but notice the dipole moment. It goes from point one, which basically means it's nonpolar, up to a difference of 3.9 when you measure the dipole moment, so getting more and more polar. Well, notice as the dipole moment gets stronger, as the molecules get more polar, in other words, the boiling point also increases. So that means it takes more energy to move them from the liquid phase into the gas phase. So let's think about that for a second. Why does that make sense? So let's say I have a beaker or something. And in my beaker, I have a whole bunch of whatever the molecules are, right? Methyl chloride, acetonitrile, whatever they are. Okay? Okay, well, in order for something to boil, it has to go from the liquid phase into the gas phase, right? So that happens once I break apart any of the attractions between the molecules. So right now, these all have intermolecular forces between one another. They're all being held together with intermolecular forces. If there were no intermolecular forces, then everything would just fly apart into gases and our whole bodies would just be gases. But there is something holding them together in the face, intermolecular forces. So, in order for, for it to go from in order for it to go from the liquid phase, let's say here, into the gas phase, I have to break apart the attraction between all of the surrounding molecules. Does that make sense? Well, in order for me to take them and to break them apart, that takes energy, right? I have to give them energy. So which of these molecules took, takes the most energy? Well, apparently it's the last one, right? Acetonitrile takes 355 Kelvin, the highest temperature, the most energy to break it apart. Why does it take the most energy? Because those molecules are also the most polar, which means they have the strongest attraction to one another. So, so, so one acetonitrile has a very strong attraction to another acetonitrile because they're both really polar, so it takes a lot of energy to break them apart. But propane, right, propane is not polar at all hardly. So those have a very weak attraction. So those are really easy to, to, to tear apart into the gas phase. So those have a really low boiling point. Negative 42 Celsius, so really easy. Does that, that kind of make sense? So as the, as the forces get stronger, it takes more energy to break them apart. So we can see that. Okay. How about hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen bonding is just a specialized type of a dipole-dipole. So it's still polar molecules, still molecules that have a polar, that are polar overall, but they have one extra little thing. They have a lone pair, and they have a hydrogen that's bonded to a fluorine, an oxygen, or a nitrogen. Excuse me. So still polar molecules, but now... You've got a hydrogen fluorine, a hydrogen oxygen, or a hydrogen nitrogen bond. So if you have this, now we have an extra special strong type of dipole dipole force called a hydrogen bond. So let's think about well, why is this polar bond stronger than the other polar bonds? Well, the difference is the hydrogen and what it's bonded to. Because fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen are the three most electronegative elements. So let me, we can finish writing that down, then we're gonna draw something real quick. Okay, so, let's look here. 
So, hydrogen is a little teeny tiny atom. Hydrogen. And here's fluorine. So, how many protons and electrons does hydrogen have? Not a trick question. How many protons and electrons does hydrogen have? Hydrogen's number one. So it's got one proton, right, in its nucleus. So orbiting that nucleus, it's got one electron, right, because it's hydrogen. Then I've got fluorine over here, and it's bigger. So it has how many protons? Nine protons and nine electrons. So it's got two in the one, and then it's got seven out here, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then two in the... 1s2. Okay, so hydrogen and fluorine are sharing their electrons. They've each shared two electrons, right? So let me draw it again. Hydrogen and fluorine are sharing two electrons. But they are not sharing them equally because I told you fluorine is the most electronegative element there is. So fluorine takes those electrons and it hogs them towards itself. So that means these two electrons are actually spending almost all of their time over here next to the fluorine and hardly any time next to the hydrogen. Are you with me? So that means the fluorine end is now partially negative, but really partially negative, and the hydrogen end is partially positive. And it's really partially positive because if fluorine comes along and it takes hydrogen's one little electron away from it, what does hydrogen have left? Just a big fat proton. So, it's partially positive, but it's almost like you've got a one plus charge. It's almost like an entirely naked proton out there. So it's really partially positive. And the fluorine is really partially negative. So it is still like a dipole-dipole, but it's just extra strong. So that's the same thing with oxygen and with nitrogen because, again, those three are the most electronegative elements. So hydrogen with a fluorine, hydrogen with an oxygen, and hydrogen with a nitrogen. So if I do that and now the hydrogen becomes really partially positive... And something else, let's say, has a lone pair. Well, a lone pair is just two naked electrons just hanging out there. So I could have a full-on two negatives with a real strong attraction to that partially positive, so it makes an extra strong dipole-dipole in a sense. Okay, so that's hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding is really important, especially like in biological systems, so in your bodies. They're found all over nature. So I'll give you a couple examples here. Everybody knows DNA. So you probably heard DNA has this famous double helix structure where basically what it is, it's two strands of nucleotides and they are twisted around each other in what's called a helix. Well, those two strands are not bonded together. They are only held together with this, hydrogen bonds. So it's this intermolecular force that actually holds the two strands together where on one side, on one side you might have an oxygen-hydrogen on one side, and the other side is the lone pair, and you're making a hydrogen bond connection. So they're not actually physically bonded together with covalent bonds. They're just held together with hydrogen bonds. This also, um, um, this also is important, like in the shape of proteins and enzymes, because you might know from bio class, proteins, proteins have, have um, like a primary structure, a secondary structure, a ternary, a ternary structure and a quaternary structure, they're called. All these different kinds of structures, and they're all like folding upon themselves. Well, the reason they're all folding together is they're trying to maximize their hydrogen bonding. They're trying to get all of the, all these connections they can. Same with enzymes. Enzymes are all folded around in weird shapes. Well, again, they're not actually bonded bonded. They're just hydrogen bonded. Okay, the last type of force, then we'll wrap this up, are the dispersion forces or the London forces. These are weak, weak forces. Any kind of atom can have these. Any kind of molecule can have these. It could be polar or nonpolar. It could be just a single atom. Anything can have dispersion forces. 
so they don't have to be polar or nonpolar. So everything you can think of, every atom, every molecule has some measure of dispersion forces. So what is a dispersion force? Well, let's take helium atoms. Let's say, I'm going to back up and just draw it myself. I think I can do a better job here. So let's say I have three helium atoms. How many electrons are in helium? So I got two electrons. So let's say there's one electron over here, one electron over here. And the electrons are just doing what? What are they doing? They're just going zoo, 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 zoo. They're just orbiting around, orbiting around, orbiting around, right? Okay. Well, let's imagine at some moment in time, as they're orbiting around, I happen to catch them when they're both on the same side of the atom. Because it's moving around, right? Well, in that split second, in that moment in time, this side of the molecule is a little bit negative. And now the back side that's being exposed is a little bit positive. So in that split second, I've created what's called an, a dipole, but it's an instantaneous dipole. But again, it's instantaneous because it's there, and the electrons keep moving, and then it's gone again. So there is a dipole, but it's not permanent like it was in the polar where it's always there all the time. It's there in a flash and then gone in a flash. Well, in that moment in time, let's say while that's happening, I have another hydrogen, hydrogen and another helium, and it slides up right next to it. So these are both heliums. So it has two electrons and they're orbiting around. Well, if this helium over here slides up next to this one, what will these electrons on the first helium do to the electrons on the next helium? They're going to cause them to do what? Repel, right? Push them away, right? So, so the electrons here will go, aye, and they'll run screaming away and try to get as far away from the other electrons as they can. Are you with me? So here I had an instantaneous dipole. Instantaneous. It was just there for a second. Instantaneous dipole. <coughs> and that caused a dipole on the other one. So this one we call an induced dipole. This one induced a dipole on the other one. You know, like you induce labor. It caused it. It caused a dipole on this one. So now this one becomes a little bit negative and a little bit positive. Aha, now look what happens. I have a positive and a negative right next to each other, so that creates an attraction. So I have a little bit of an attraction. But again, it's super weak. Why is it super weak? Because it's there for like a nanosecond, and it's gone again, and they're back moving again. So it's just there and gone, there and gone, there and gone. So in a dipole-dipole molecule, I mean, I mean a polar molecule, it's always there. This is just there for a nanosecond, and it's gone. So these are the weakest forces you can have, okay? So these are super weak. So all things being equal, all things being equal, um, uh, dispersion is the weakest, then dipole, dipole, and then hydrogen bonding is by far the strongest. Okay, so how does dispersion forces change? So I won't spend a lot of time on this. Again, come back in 110, I'll tell you more. But basically, it's going to depend on the bigger the electron cloud, the, the stronger it can be. Because the bigger the electron cloud is, the more easily then, I mean, um, the more easily then you can do what's called polarize it, or you can, or you can kind of like smush the electrons one way or the other. So, let's say, let's say I have a really big atom. I don't know, let's say it's, I don't know, uranium or something. So uranium is, like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, yada, 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 clear down here. And it goes all the way down to 7s2, uh, what is this, 5f3, right? So uranium has seven levels of electrons. So it's really big. Well, well remember, we said that, remember, we said that, remember we said the ones that are really far away, they have a very weak attraction to the nucleus, right? Because they're so far away. So it's really easy then for uranium... For uranium, whoops, I want to do that. For uranium, 
for me to take the electrons that are way out here and I can easily smush them all onto one side because they're so far away. But if it's a really small atom, like, like let's say it's hydrogen or something, well now they're so close, it's kind of hold them in tight. Or, or maybe it's lithium and it's three. It's much harder for me to kind of smush them all to one side. Plus, if it's so small and I smush them all to one side, well now these are so close together, they're all negative also and, and, and they don't want to be together. So the short answer, I know this seems really confusing, is, is as the mass goes up, typically, um, um, as the mass increases, the dispersion forces get stronger. As the mass increases, the dispersion forces get stronger. Because if they get heavier, they typically have more electrons. That's the easy takeaway. As molar mass increases, dispersion force increases. Just write that down. As molar mass increases, dispersion force increases. So I'll show you that here. I'm give you three. I mean, I'm give you uh, um, uh, one more example. So let's take five atoms: helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. These are all noble gases, nonpolar. So, so they're nonpolar. So they can't do hydrogen bonding. They can't do dipole dipole, but they can once in a while wind up with their electrons on one side or the other. Well, you see, as they get bigger. So again, they have a bigger electron cloud. They have a higher boiling point. And again, we said that tells you it takes a little more energy for you to break them apart into the gas phase. So the ones that are heavier must have stronger forces than the ones that are lighter. Can you see that? Okay, let's tie a big bow on this thing and wrap it up. This is the longest lab ever. Okay, so generally, how does the strength increase? So basically, if they're roughly the same molar mass, then hydrogen bonding is normally the strongest, then dipole, dipole, and then dispersion tends to be the weakest. So all things being equal, so the, so, so the mass is roughly the same, hydrogen bonding is the strongest, dipole, dipole is next, and then dispersion tends to be the weakest. Now, now that's not true if one is just a thousand times as heavier let's say, than another one. But if the mass is about the same, it's going to be true. Okay, so let me show you an example of that. Oh, and first, I'll remind you real quickly, what kind of molecules can have dispersion? Everything. Everything has dispersion, I said. Every atom, every molecule has dispersion. Polar, nonpolar, doesn't matter. Everything has dispersion. Which ones can have dipole, dipole? Got to be polar ones, only polar ones. And which kind can have hydrogen bonding? Polar ones with an HF, an HO, or an HN bond. So it's much more selective as you get up. Strongest, medium, weakest. So everybody has these weak forces. A few also have these stronger forces. And a very few have the strongest forces. Okay, so let's just do it in a couple examples and let's wrap it up. So let's look at these three molecules. I have three molecules. Notice they all have about the same molar mass. Can you see that? Can you see that? They're all right around 30. So the mass isn't the difference. But, but notice the crazy difference in the boiling points. This one boils super easy, negative 88. This one's negative 19.5. And this one's harder to boil, 64.7. Why is methanol so much harder to boil than the other two, do you think? Tell me. It's more polar, OK. Well, what else is unique about methanol? Okay, let me back up. What kind of forces does methanol have? It is polar, you're right, so it has dipole, dipole. It also has dispersion because everything has dispersion. But what else does it have? Hydrogen bonding. See this right here? Has a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen. So that means it has hydrogen bonding. How about formaldehyde? Does formaldehyde have hydrogen bonding? Does it have a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen? 
It does not. It is polar. So this one has hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. This one is polar because, because, because it's not symmetrical, right? They're all different. I mean, they're different. So it does have dipole, dipole. Dipole, dipole. How about the last one? That one is perfectly symmetrical. So it's nonpolar, which means it only has dispersion. So ethane has the weakest forces, so it's the easiest to boil, the lowest boiling point. Does that make sense? Formaldehyde has the next strongest forces, so it's harder to boil. And then um, methanol has the strongest intermolecular forces. So it takes the most energy to boil. Can you kind of reason that out? Okay, then try the example on your handout. Prove it to me. So here's three molecules. You tell me. Two of these are gases. One is the liquid. Tell me which one's the liquid. Figure it out. Talk it over. This is the last thing, I think, isn't it? This is the last thing? Yeah. Yep, this is it. So you tell me which one is the liquid. Talk it over. Figure it out. How do you know? Okay, so what do you guys think? Which of those? Hydrogen peroxide is going to be the liquid. So you're saying hydrogen peroxide has the strongest forces, in other words. Okay, so yeah, so why? So let's, so, okay, so let's, okay, so let's go through it. Well, they all have dispersion because everything has dispersion. They all three have dispersion. Everything has dispersion. They are all polar. So formaldehyde is polar, so it has dipole-dipole. Fluoromethane, also not symmetrical, so it has dipole-dipole. The dipole. hydrogen peroxide is the winner, you're right, because it has those magical hydrogen-oxygen bonds, which means, oh, look, that means it can have hydrogen bonding. So that is the strongest kind of force. So therefore, yes, it'll be the liquid. Does that make sense? Are you thrilled? No. Me either. Okay. Okay. So, we are done. 78 minutes and 39.